why are you not wearing the TV TV cap? Um, I actually couldn't find it. I was looking for it this morning. I th- perhaps it's in the car, but I'm not sure. We received some um, some awesome <laughs> gifts from a fan out in Thailand. Yeah, I saw that caps and wristbands and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Ready, Oliver? Yeah. Sure. Great. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Bamton Experience. Today we are joined by uh, Steen Pilarsen, um, the current one of the current BWF commentators. Um, first of all, before we get into the episode, we are obviously not in our regular set. We have moved to uh, to to the place where we practice, just in the hall behind us. You can't see it, see it because of the curtains. Curtains, yeah. So. Um, but yeah, we, 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 why actually? Why are we out here today? Well, we are here because <laughs> we just finished training. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have a very, very tight schedule. So we didn't have time to go to Stain's place. It's uh, quite far from here. And we didn't have time to go to Copenhagen where you live. So this was uh, the place to be. And it's also a place that Stain knows well because uh, he actually has a uh, long past here. And that's one of the first things that we uh, wanted to talk to you about. Because there is probably quite a few of the viewers who don't necessarily know anything about your background they probably know your voice yeah but they they won't know like why you actually are the bwf commentator where all your knowledge uh, is from so can you try and kind of take us a little bit through how how you ended up in the position you're in now yeah it was uh as as many um jobs a little bit of a coincidence but um one of the uh, things that might have led to it was that i've spent 15 years in in the hall uh, behind us here and I was actually a little bit annoyed uh, when I uh, when I arrived here because somebody is taking my parking space uh, <laughs> at the lot uh, outside. So I, I um, I've been through quite a lot of uh, World Championship um, preparations, and that's not as a player. That's not as a player, definitely not. <laughs> have you been playing yourself? I have been playing myself. I've uh, been playing in the um, at the club level in the highest um, division in, in Denmark. And then I know that you have been the national coach here in uh, here in Denmark. Um, how come you chose to to go down that path as a as a coach? Well, um, it started out um, as a, a youth coach because I could earn some uh, pocket money while I was studying, um, and it was better than uh, doing some cleaning or hmm. working at a at a truck stop or whatever um, the options were. And um, and then I found out that it was uh, quite interesting. It was quite funny. And and sometimes I um, I accidentally hit um, a good um, a coaching and, and, and felt I helped some players. And, and that was nice. It's a nice feeling that you can help someone. Mm. So um, from then on, it just um, one uh, one step led to another. And I, I pretty soon decided that I was going to accept uh, whichever challenges um, arrived in front of me um, in my badminton career. I loved badminton. Started playing as a seven-year-old, and did it that, become that, an that, obsession that, at at some point? Or? Yeah, it, it, I mean, basically, I'm just a guy who's watched too much badminton in my mm. life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where did where did you start your training career? Which club? I, I started in, in the club I played in, in uh, Lilo, a badminton club. Started coaching uh, young players aged um, 7 to 16. Okay. But you, you played at a quite high level yourself, right? Like I played I played at Danish uh, level. Uh, I played in uh, in the first team in Lilo for, for two seasons. Which was in the highest league? In it was the highest league. Yeah. It was the highest league. But yeah. obviously it was in the doubles disciplines. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, I, I simply gained too much weight um, over the winter, so um, <laughs> okay. I was in good shape uh, yeah. in in the uh, fall when the tournament started, but um, but it decreased from then on. Mm. All right, that's what Christmas uh, <laughs> does, Christmas to, does some to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at at what point did you? W- what year did you be become the national coach here for Denmark? Uh, that was in two thousand and one. Okay. I was the assistant coach from '95 um, to 2001, and then I became the national coach back then. Okay. So, at what point did you decide that this is what you want to to do for a living? Because I guess at that at that time it was becoming a full time job. Also, the years pre prior to to becoming the national coach, right? Yeah, it was, and and um, it was basically uh, after I finished my studies, and uh, I still kept uh, playing too much badminton, watching too much badminton, coaching too much badminton. 
and I played too much badminton also mm-hmm. during my studies. So um, my exam wasn't really uh, something to brag about. What and did you study? A chemical engineer. Okay, all right. Um, so um, yeah. the more I, I looked at the job adverts and so on, the more I, I felt like just continuing in, in badminton and um, yeah. But at, at some point I would have had to, to get another job unless I sort of um, rose in the um, in the categories in in, uh, in coaching and badminton because there weren't that many coaches uh, living from badminton back then. Yeah, like a full time living. Yeah, yeah. There, I, yeah, I guess there was only two or something. Yeah. So you actually took over in 2005 uh, with the being the head coach. 2001. Ah, okay, all right, yeah. Because I started in Bonnevue in 2005, so that was actually with Stein as the uh, head coach here. My first time here was in the summer of 2005. I actually still remember when uh, I played on the 19 national championships in Ishbia. Yeah. yeah, you remember? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I remember you were there watching, yeah. uh, and it was uh, like a big moment for me and some of the other guys as well that like the head coach of the national team was there. And I think only, I don't know if it was like right after, but it was only like a few months after I started training here a couple yeah. of times a week. So we have that kind of background mm. history. That wasn't yeah. such a big moment for me in SPI, but uh, but I remember <laughs> being there yeah. and I remember yeah. you won it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's back when I still won tournaments. <laughs> yeah. How old were you when you started in here? In 2005, I must have been 19. Yeah, because yeah, I just won the under 19 national championship, so you could have figured that out. How do you remember Hans Christian yeah. as a as, as a 19 year old uh, player? Uh, do you he, even he remember was attacking. me? Yeah, yeah, he was attacking all the time. Yeah, true. And true. Um, <laughs> and I remember one of the things that we started working with here. Um, firstly, I don't know if it was the right thing. But uh, one of the things we work with is that he is uh, very much a, a front foot runner. Mm-hmm. So um, so that um, he doesn't use his heels a lot mm-hmm. in, in the footwork and, and that's really tough uh, on the calf and, and the thighs and so on. So that's one of the things we started working with. Uh, and from then on, um, I don't remember uh, that much about it because um, uh, priorities were on, on the players that were uh, a little bit better than you. Yeah. Uh, I never think time. I really had you as my, like my main coach. No. It's always been no. someone else. Yeah. But it's quite fun you mentioned that part with the, me being on on my toes. I'm not sure if it's even much better now. It probably is a little bit better, but actually my son Vincent when he's running now, he's only running on the front of the mm. feet. Yeah. I have no idea why, but he he <laughs> kind of uh, it's, he's it's doing the, the same. <laughs> yeah, it's probably in the genes. So it's one of the uh, one of the uh, employees from the kindergarten told us that we needed to work on that with him, uh, so he gets used to running more on the full foot. So yeah, when I was told that, I thought of uh, yeah back yeah. in uh, back <laughs> in the days because we worked on it quite a bit in my uh, in my training. I remember when you when when you were playing on television, they always talked about you were like extremely aggressive and needed mm. to yeah, to true. build all the layers to your game. Um, mm. I've never experienced that version of you. I don't think so. I mean, no. I I see I see you as a pretty like defensive player, hard hard uh, hard working player, fighting really a lot, being down on your knees most of the time and stuff. Yeah, um, for sure. As a senior player, I think I won more on physique than mm. attack, especially in the later part of my career. But I think my game has also developed that way because uh, okay. it is very also physically draining to be very aggressive all the time. I think the game in some periods has also changed a bit. I see not myself as defensive, but more as uh, I'm looking for the way to kind of count- counter attack. So yeah, maybe this the start is defensive and then I try to exploit the But you and Yen must have been a, a bit similar then. Yen was also very, very aggressive, right? Mm. He, he was faster. Yeah, he, he was extremely fast, uh. extremely fast forward Yeah, uh, and fast backwards. Uh, I don't think they were that similar. Um, uh, I think Yen is, um, he, he, without going too much into his playing style, um, he, he was a bit more um, building um, the opportunities and so on mm. he, he had a better net game your net game at, at, at the beginning was not that good and it was i mean it was a typical um youth player uh, attacking style where mm. where uh, people played the back line and they shouldn't have done that because mm. you were there and you had a really really big smash but but when you try to uh, sort of um implement that as a senior player you figure out that, that people they have some good defenses <laughs> yeah. as well and sometimes they don't live to you so you have to be able to earn your own mm. attacks and so on so i think i see it as a development as well in your yeah. game yeah. 
um, the ability to play uh, rallies and um, and then sort of set up your own opportunities. I don't know if that setting up the opportunities that, that could probably still get a little bit better. But For sure. I actually see you uh, sure. see some of the same playing style in in uh, Sindhu. Okay. Well, she's got a big smash as well, yeah. but she but she's not that good at at setting herself up for mm. the big smash but she's really good retrieving and in the end finally getting so much back that she gets attacking mm. opportunities i haven't heard that comparison before actually no yeah but i also i i i completely agree with like the front of the court is uh, definitely not the best part of my game but it is the part of my game that i've developed the most over the years yeah uh, and on the contrary i think my big smash is uh like Going, going downhill. <laughs> going downhill. It's it's not that big anymore, unfortunately. But isn't isn't it usually the the kind of transformation a youth player needs to to learn? Uh, I, I I often see younger players coming up with um with one thing that they are very very good at, but the game be- becomes so much more complex when you face the best players. Um, I think Victor is also a, a good example. He he had a crazy attack when he was like 16 years old. Um, but suddenly he started to to play against players who was extremely good in the defense and extremely good at playing rallies. Um, and I, I think I think many many youth players uh, experience that. Suddenly they have to be way more mature in in the way they play. Yeah, and, and suddenly uh, uh, in a period of time, Victor's attacking game was totally gone because mm-hmm. I, I don't know who he felt he had to play like. But his he was becoming a a passive player and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think figuring out and and finding out which playing style you're going to go with as a senior player, and there might be several throughout your career, but that, I think that's one of the most important thing uh, as a uh, in the transition phase from a junior to a senior player. And I think in Europe, um, we often see uh, junior players coming forward with skills that are good in the junior um, competitions but are actually not worth much in the senior uh, competitions. Why do you think that is? I think it's um, because we we develop players um, playing, they, they start playing for fun. Mm. Um, and um, we start competition at a very, very early age and mm. we play on the big court and, and so on. So there's a lot of clearing in, in uh, youth players. We can also see it in the some of the lower ranked European nations, they, ne- they rarely use the front court. Mm. Um, we, we, did a, we did an experiment once uh, back in my, um, my home club when I was a, a youth coach then where we lowered the net for the uh, youngsters and mm. suddenly the game became much, much more like um, the senior game. We know there were a lot more attacks, there were a lot more drives and stuff like that. So that might be something that um, mm. is worth uh, experimenting with for for the um, junior coaches, um, making it more interesting playing junior badminton because of course you're not as tall as um, as when you are outgrown, mm. and um, yeah, the uh, the net is just a, a big big obstacle, uh, so you simply can't smash. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess on like on the world tour stage, I would say in general that the front of the court is where matches are decided. Like especially in singles I, i'm not so sure about doubles but it's probably the same but in singles if you don't control the front of the court you basically don't have a chance of winning yeah, yeah. i agree i agree um i think about 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 changing changing style and and growing up i think also sometimes it's about if when you when you when you want to implement something new to your game you might take take a step back yeah. in order to to try to learn it and I- implement it in your game and then it, you will benefit from it uh, later on. I, I think we have seen that with many players. Also, when when men's single goes in a certain direction, some of the old players sees maybe uh, the way Momota plays. Okay, I need to adapt some of his strengths strengths as well. Um, I think a guy like Srikant was interesting. Um, I think he was a very, very attacking player when he was coming. Solely attacking. Solely attacking yeah. when he was coming up. And I don't know exactly why, um, but suddenly he started to transform into a player who was playing it around. I mean, not not that attacking anymore, um, not that dangerous. I think he has he, he's got it back a little bit though. Um, I don't know if, if if it was something that he was thinking about that I need to work on this uh, this area in my game in order to become a more complex badminton player in the longer run. Um, 
I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's true. Uh, I saw it when when some of the players. I don't know if you guys remember them or, or uh, the listeners, but Dong Zhong and Sun Jun from mm-hmm. China. Uh, Sun Jun, the world champion from uh, 1999. And um, I remember them. And Dong Zhong, yeah. Dong Zhong, a very attacking player, mm. uh, really strong in the attack. And Sun Jun, the opposite, a very strong retrieving player. And they had, a, they spent a year or so playing the opposite playing style to become better. Sun Jun needed to become better at um, at attacking mm. because otherwise he couldn't score. And Dong Zhong needed to become better at, at playing defense. Uh, it worked for them. A, a lot of players probably try it, but but doesn't get uh, success mm-hmm. with it. But I I totally agree that sometimes that is the way to go, and also to to figure out what is the um, what is the uh, golden middle uh, mm-hmm. way uh, yeah, yeah. in in between um, attacking and defending and and sort of drifting away from your strength. I, mm-hmm. I still f- feel that it's really really important to. Uh, grow your strength mm. and and that's sometimes what makes the difference in my opinion on on a good coach and an excellent coach that the excellent coaches they are able to actually grow your strength there's a, a coaching is basically there's a lot of coaches that are mistake finders and and so you you're missing that that's not good enough that's not good enough either and so on mm. and, and that's true and that's the way to to start out and I just feel it's it's really really important that you can also say hey you got the biggest smash um mm. This could be your bread and butter. Uh, let's mm-hmm. figure out how to do it. Let's make a game plan that uh, makes you the biggest attacker in the world. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if you go down the road that you talk about Dong Jong and Sun Jun do, uh, where they do actually the complete opposite of what they used to, you also you need to have like a very special mindset and you need to be really strong mentally because in that year you will also risk producing much worse results than you've done you before. You will you will produce much worse results. Yeah. And you will of course be uh, like losing confidence and stuff like that and maybe it's not that easy to actually find back to your strengths again. Uh, afterwards you can get confused about your playing style and everything. Yes. So I think it's it's quite and also it, like it sounds simple but it's quite tricky to to do it that way. It's tricky and it was easier back in those days that's 23 mm. years ago. Yeah. The system in badminton was totally different. They didn't have to play that mm. many tournaments and 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 stuff like that. Mm. But my my um my favorite example of this is actually Tiger Woods mm. who won a lot of tournaments in golf. He already won majors and so on and then it took a year mm. off to change his swing yeah. so it became more consistent in different uh, in difficult weather conditions. Okay. Now that's the world's best player yeah. taking ruining a swing that's already won him loads and loads of titles. Yeah. Going down in play in in uh, performance level yeah. in order to be able to perform at the most difficult of situations. I I really love that. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it says something about that you always like you always need to develop even if you're yeah. the best actually if you if you don't develop yeah, it's even more uh, important because yeah. everybody is like you said earlier everybody's looking at uh, oh how is Momota doing I need to I need to do more of that and mm-hmm. I think actually Shrikant he suffered a lot Shrikant and Victor Axelsen they they got beat up real bad mm-hmm. by Kenta Momota when he uh, returned from his suspension mm-hmm. and and I think that uh, Shrikant suffered there in in self confidence um mm-hmm. So um, yeah. it's good to see him back now and uh, a key player in, in winning the Thomas Cup. Yeah, I mean, it, it it might be a part of a bigger plan, but it it could also be that he simply forgot what got him there in the first yeah. place. Um, I don't know what what was the case. I I had the feeling that he definitely forgot who he was as a player a little bit. Um, We need to get him on the sure. podcast yeah. and ask him. He's a good yeah. guy. I like yeah. him, though. So yeah. we'll get him here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll ask him. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's it's very interesting to have you on, Stein. And like we were actually inviting you on as a commentator, but right now we are talking. We much are coaching more. stuff. Yeah, we are in coaching <laughs> stuff, uh, and that that makes me think. Like, do do you miss that part? Like, because you used to be a full time coach, and yeah. now I w- I know you are still the coach of a Danish league club, uh, but you're not there on a daily basis. No. It's it's only for league matches, so yeah. it's like 10, 12 yeah, twelve times it's a year. It's more like a manager yeah. job and, yeah. uh, and a match coaching. So job. I w- I would say you are a full time commentator now, yeah. right? That would be correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
do, do you not miss that part? Because I can hear that that you have this passion still yeah, about yeah, development yeah. And, and all these. I sometimes things. miss it. I, yeah. I sometimes want to throw the headset away and run down mm. to the court and and say, "Hey, listen up! This is how we're going to do it." <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, but then I remember all the other stuff that's that's involved uh, in it because it's not just performing on on the green mat. Um, mm. There's a lot of other things into it, and and the way that coaching is. Uh, today, uh, it's uh, a lot tougher. I, I think it becomes increasingly more uh, demanding. Um, mm. And then there, there's some countries that have, of course, more resources than others. But I, I sometimes miss it, but but not the team coaching mm. thing like um, like I, I was used to. I, I, I've experienced uh, enough of that, in my opinion. But sometimes there's someone that say, hey, i would like to work with that pair or that combination or that player and, and so on. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I really uh, like my uh, my commentator job. So what was the best part about being a coach? Was it the the actual match situations, the daily uh, training, or? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question because I think it all it all added up. Um, the matches was uh, where everything was at stake. I really loved. Um, I, I had a couple of years uh, working in a more civilian job, and I didn't have that. Did we win or lose? I mean, you have the, um, you, you you know the outcome in an hour, an hour and a half. Was it good? Was it bad? Um, black and white. Uh, It's instant feedback. Instant feedback, yeah. and and you don't have that in a. Um, in a uh, civilian coach position, it could take years and you might not even get the feedback from the coachee or, or whatever. So the instant feedback in badminton is is uh, fantastic. And also uh, when you feel that you can help uh, people and when you can make a difference, that that's, that's a really, really um, nice thing. Um, I didn't like all the uh, administration, all the paperwork mm. attached to it and, and There's also a lot of players that are really uh, um, sort of uh, trying to get a piece of you, and mm. and if you don't look their way, they get a little bit annoyed, uh, get irritated. You have to do selections. That's also something that um, that sparks um, uh, discussions and mm. perhaps even disagreements. Mm. Do you have like one memory where, because you say that you really enjoyed that feeling of being able to help someone? Do you have like one memory of where you really felt like you? made a difference on court oh there's so many times <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i'm uh, sure there is i'm sure there is I'm sure no there that is. it's it's um it's very difficult um there's been some occasions in uh, in the men's doubles at mm-hmm. the all england final jens eriksen martin lundgaard against um lee wan wa and uh, chung chan fok yeah. and also amazing um, match Also, uh, when Peter Rasmussen won his uh, World Championships back in '97, I was coaching, and mm-hmm. and he had some uh, difficulties coming into the individual tournament and so on. And we we talked about them and discussed it, and and at least it it, it um, I can't say it helped, but it it had a different outcome in the mm-hmm. individual tournament. So that was also quite satisfying. Um, and that was as an assistant, actually. You that was an assistant yeah, coach. Yeah. yeah. What do you remember uh, the most? Um, is it the, the 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 best results you had with a with a few players, or is it like the the journey to get there? I think that's often a thing that you talk about. Is it really the result, or is it the journey to get there? It's the journey to get there, okay. definitely. And and that was also you mentioned the daily practice. And if you don't love the daily practice, it's time to find another job because there's a lot more daily practice. Mm. Then there is uh, like 90% percent of the time. Ninety percent <laughs> of the time, then there is uh, golden moments uh, yeah. on court, um, and um, yeah, it's it's important to remember to celebrate those golden moments. You often get caught up in the next tournament and the next tournament, yeah. and those at home who were not at this tournament who also needs attention and so on. So, so you gotta love the everyday life. The moment you don't love the everyday life, then it's then it's over. Mm. That's where coaching and playing is not very different, actually. You you need the same as a player, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. What is your do Do you have some kind of like coaching philosophy or something, something that you did different or? I I don't think I have, uh, but but I would need help to figure it out. Um, 
because I'm I'm not that um, I'm not that good of um, of sort of setting up these plans or saying this is how I do it, this is my method, and so on. But then I've had the experience that someone has been asking me about uh, questions and then presented me with this is actually how you do things, mm. and I look at it and say, oh yeah, that that's that's actually, that's actually right, mm. but I'm not conscious about it. So. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that I'm loving the technical, uh, tactical part of the game. Mm. Um, but but apart from that, um, I don't think I have any uh, sort of specific um, style. There's there's no uh, Steen style uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, I don't think so. It, I think it's about um, uh, figuring out that every player is. Uh, different to mm. all the others. There's no players that are the same, so you can't really mass produce uh, things. You can you can do it to a certain extent, but then you need to to um, cope with the player at hand. Mm. Yeah. All right. Who's Sh the most difficult player that you've ever worked with? <laughs> 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 Against there's been a lot. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. Just mention uh, w some that's not watching this podcast. Yeah. Some of the older guys, <laughs> yeah. they don't watch it anyway. No, I, I think it would be unfair to... Uh, I, I, I have enough, two that comes enough. to my mind uh, <laughs> where I sort of like... I s when, when they stopped um, on the on the practice where I had them, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't necessarily on the national practice, but when I stopped, it was, uh, or then it, when they stopped attending that practice, it was like... <sighs> <laughs> My job is going to be a little bit easier now. Yeah, yeah, yeah much, yeah. much, much easier. Yeah. Because if you have players that are difficult on the practice, they tend to take up sixty, seventy percent yeah. of your yeah. attention. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you hear, uh, you hear a bunch of stories uh, about the old days that the players were pretty, pretty harsh mm. to each other. Um, It's I, I've never really experienced that in my time here for the yeah. past uh, six seven years. Is I mean the, the men's single category the training has just been going very well. People are good people. Um, no yeah. no big arguments. But in the men's double categories a few years back, there mm. was uh, some some pretty big egos. But, um, but I think in general also in the men's singles group in the past it's also been a little bit different. Like it's always been working better as a group I think at least that's my experience but I think in general the the way the conversations and everything went in the hall was harsher back 15 15 years ago when I started also to also now. on the men's singles yeah uh, I, I think okay. so in, in general actually yeah. there's a lot of competition for resources mm. um, at, at, at that uh, period of time mm. when I started it's, it's true there was a lot of competition in in the uh, Men's double, and not all of it was uh, was was healthy, in mm. my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw a lot of older players trying to uh, sort of um, uh, talk their way into mm. the uh, team, and yeah. um, and that wasn't the right way to do it. Mm. So, so uh, I guess it's still there um, that that uh, if there's a fight for resources, then the competition is is tough. But we tried to we tried to make a change with the team because I had a good team around me. I had. Um, Jan Jorgensen, not the player, yeah, but yeah. the coach. Uh, as an assistant coach, he was a fantastic um, assistant coach. I had Jens Meibom, the mm -hmm. now head of sports, as an assistant coach as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. we had some good head of sports and, and directors and so on. So we tried to work with the culture and sort of make it easier for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> but I think the competitive environment back then was probably also harder than it is now. Like we had more, for example, in doubles, more pairs competing uh, where right now it's a bit more divided into some very few good ones and then we have the yeah. next level and the next level. I think back then it was the a little bit was, more... The depth was bigger yeah, back then. There sure. was five, six pairs yeah. competing for resources yeah. in the men's doubles yeah. discipline. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean when you say resources? Uh, funding to go to yeah. tournaments. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, back then it was almost, um, almost solely funded by uh, the Federation. I mean, uh, yeah, sponsorship money wasn't the same. Prize money wasn't the same. No, yeah. and and you had to have um, uh, maybe a part-time job mm. to um, yeah. to uh, make a living. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's make a big development sense. there. Should we change a little bit? Yeah, let's into uh, talk about more uh, your your commentator job and your yeah. commentator skills because uh, we also had a lot of questions about that. Obviously, I think a lot of our viewers, as you said, probably. M 
mostly know you from uh, from that part. Um, and I will say and you are a very very uh, recommended guest. I would if, yeah. if you d- if you okay. didn't knew yeah, yeah. we well, have been. Uh, it's good to hear. Yeah. yeah, it's good to hear. Gil, Morden, or Steen was the was the requests from the from the fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you're the first one on. Uh, one of the first things uh, that I wanted to hear about, because I think it's obvious for everyone that you have a lot of knowledge about BAMS and you uh, you have your opinions and everything. And it's also like you you know so much. So when you prepare for a tournament that you need to commentate, do you actually need to prepare? Uh, or is it all just like basic knowledge you have? It, it depends a lot whether it's a tournament where I'm going to have to do solo commentary. Mm-hmm. means that I'm responsible for the whole match or if I'm going to do um, color commentary where I have a lead commentator sort of running the uh, match and uh, introducing the players and stuff like that. Um, If I have to do um, solo commentary I have to prepare uh, quite a bit more Mm. than uh, doing it as a color but Mm. there's still some preparation because i mean, when I work with uh, with Jill, which I mostly work with, mm. who is extremely skilled, I know that yeah. she's she's got almost everything covered, mm. and and I need to try and figure out if I can find some angles that are um, outside of that. So I, I shouldn't do double work and and mm. try to emulate uh, Jill. Sometimes there's other lead commentators, and then it becomes a mix of um, of adding in some uh, some facts and and the um, the odd angles becomes uh, fewer yeah. and and when i'm doing solo um, there's a lot more uh, technical stuff um, a lot of uh, rundown running orders uh, mm. what's coming in uh, next what's what's the uh, order that the players are coming in to is the uh, camera starting on anas or is uh, yeah. or are they starting on momota uh, in terms of uh, profiles and stuff like that yeah, so, so you need to be able to kind of set the scene for the viewer in those yeah. uh, situations yeah. whereas and, a color commentator it's actually the leads as a role. color commentator I, i basically don't have to say anything yeah. unless i'm getting asked so so yeah. basically i could do pretty much uh, no prep and and, yeah. and still um, still do a good job probably not a good job but i could still be there mm. um So so the thing is, of course, I mean, you you have to follow badminton. You have mm-hmm. to know what's been going on. How has your results been throughout this year? What is the context? Uh, who is struggling? Who is uh, the favorite at the moment? And, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, But don't you do that also just out of interest? So like if you're not at work, so for example, now with... We're here in Denmark. Yeah. Are you not following the results of the Commonwealth Games? I am. Yeah. I am. But... but um, This is also some kind of critical mass. If you only have mm. like five, six tournaments a year, well, then maybe you can't really afford to do that because mm. then you would have to have uh, a, a part-time job uh, next to it and and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, yeah, I follow it, and and um, I probably would. I, I'm not sure if I would follow the Commonwealth Games. Uh, that this is the first time I really followed it, mm. um, but. Um, But but keeping up to date with what's going on in the badminton community mm. is um, is in my opinion part of my job to be prepared for the tournaments, and it's not it's not so easy to find uh, uh, that kind of information. It's When did you first become a commentator, and have you only been on uh, on the worldwide broadcast or? Have you ever been commentator on the Danish I, TV? Yeah, I, ha- I have been on Danish TV, but not but not a regular um, commentator. I've been on and off uh, a couple of times with the when TV3 uh, mm-hmm. was the right holder, and a couple of times when TV2 was the right holder. But it actually started when I was a coach back in uh, in I think ninety six, seven or eight, something like that. It was in Hong Kong. All the Danish players had lost in the second round or so, so uh, I'd made myself available, and mm-hmm. someone asked me if I wanted to do commentary. I wasn't really sure. Um, but um, but they persuaded me and um, and it was uh, a lead that um, that pretty much didn't know anything about badminton. So I had to explain the rules <laughs> and the names of the shots um, to him before we got on the way. But that was when my my debut as a commentator as uh, Stephen Peterson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Were you presented <laughs> like that? I was presented like Stephen Peterson. That was that was much easier for everybody. <laughs> all right, all right. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that, it didn't go well. I can oh, say that. Uh, uh, so you've, I mean, I guess for sure that you have developed uh, over the years. But like, 
one of the challenges I would see as a commentator, even though my English is fine, uh, I don't have a, a problem speaking English, but I know from like my experience of being a commentator in Danish, that even in Danish, I tend to use some of the same expressions over and over again, and my vocabulary is more limited in English. Yeah. So I would imagine if I had to be in your position that it would be so difficult to keep on finding new words for a great shot or a fantastic shot. Uh, it, I can't find I, my, yeah. I have three words now that yeah. I use. But <laughs> the first one in Hong Kong, I, I only had one and the players, they really uh, stuck it to my nose afterwards. Saying, okay. th- so that word really was repeated over and over yeah. again in practice. Yeah. Um, you, but still, that, that, you still feel like that's a challenge? Uh, yes, even now? definitely yeah. a challenge, oh. definitely a challenge. Yeah. Um, I always feel like I have insufficient uh, vocabulary. Mm. Okay. I'm thinking what 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 makes a great commentator? I think it's interesting because I mean often you know big big sport achievements is is often um connected to something the the commentator says at that moment. Mm. I mean 90 92 where Danish won the European uh, championships in football. You know, we we all know some of the things that the commentator says, so yeah, that can true. become legendary as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so first of all, what do you, what is your philosophy on like commentating? Do you have something that you really focus on? Well, like, <laughs> I don't have a philosophy on coaching, so I even less have a philosophy <laughs> on on commentary. <laughs> But I learned a lot from Jill Clark. Yeah, I uh, the best in the I game. I asked her a lot because I feel like. I, I know how I am, that if people ask me a lot, I will give answers to their questions. But if they don't ask me, I don't sort of like intrude on them and say, hey, I yeah. think you should play a little bit more like and mm. stuff like that. So I've learned a lot uh, from her. And, and I think the overall um, goal is that the commentators must add to the uh, experience mm. from just watching with no sound on uh, and explain and... and, and uh, sort of make uh, the audience more uh, knowledgeable mm-hmm. about uh, badminton. One of the things that's also very nice is if they, uh, if, if a commentator can show um, uh, passion and, and sort of hype things, mm-hmm. that's not one of my strengths. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, I, I feel it's difficult because uh, my nature is not like uh, the big expressions and so mm-hmm. on. But if there is a big expression, then It, it, then it's good, mm. then it's good. But there's a lot of commentators that are much better uh, at that than uh, than I am, and I totally agree. The sayings, uh, the the uh, quotes from from commentary that comes out is um, yeah. is fantastic, and and some just have that uh, skill. And I, I remember a Norwegian commentator when Norway in uh, in football beat uh, England. Um, a legendary comment says, Maggie Thatcher, your boys took a hell of a beating. Mm. <laughs> uh, and saying that on television, I mean, you, you must have lost his mind yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for a few moments or so. Yeah. Don't you think most of the commentators p- plan it? I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think if you plan it too much, it, it becomes, um, it becomes uh, visible or, or, or mm. you can hear that it's, it's planned. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do think... I do think there's some that are uh, figuring out some some good um, quotes that they they want to yeah. put in if they can. It uh, it was quite fun when I saw uh, uh, a YouTube clip of uh, India winning the Thomas Cup. Uh, I heard Jill say uh, when when Srikant won the final point, she's like, "History is made," and. As soon as she said it, I was like, she said the exact same thing in 2016 when we won it, the same tone of voice and everything. Yeah. So I had to find it on YouTube, and it was the exact same thing. And it, it's just like a quote that I've remembered because obviously I've seen the clip from 16 so many times, and it sounds great and everything. So I, I guess she didn't plan it or anything, but it's just no. again to show that like I I. I connect those two things. Like when I won, or when we won, when I won the final point, I remember that one quote. And yeah, yeah now she did the exact same thing with the streak. And I, I found that yeah, quite fun actually. Yeah, I, I think she's playing it. Yeah, I yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe. But she's been there for 25 years, so it's hard maybe, to come maybe, up with new stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's, 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 it's hard. Yeah. But there was there, there was a quite fun story. This one, there was a guy. I don't know who it was, but he made a homepage www.jillclark.co.uk, okay. where he actually made some buttons with 
uh, cuts of Jill saying, I don't believe it, or <laughs> history is made, or, ooh, I didn't like that, or whatever, whatever we know what, what Jill is, is often saying. Would you say. believe that? <laughs> and then he put in some, um, some uh, music so you could make your own Jill Clark rap. I, I <laughs> thought that was pretty fun, but yeah. now it's gone. Ah, okay. Oh, that's a shame. I would like to check that yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, in, yeah. Now we're speaking of Jill. Uh, you got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, comments and positive feedback for doing one great thing. Do you know what that is? No. You got Jill on Twitter. That's right. Yeah, that, that, that was, was that uh, was really frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> really frustrating. Yeah, you have what like seven thousand followers? Yeah, uh, something like that. And Jill got that in uh, seven minutes. Or so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I think it's good. It's, it's amazing. Good. It's amazing because one thing, uh, and we just, just we don't have to make this like a big uh, appreciation podcast about Jill. But one thing that is really great about her that you also mentioned is that she knows like all the stats. Uh, she's so well prepared, and that's one thing she's also doing now on Twitter. Uh, adding these daily fun facts uh, yeah. at tournaments, and it's that's just what we need exactly. That's like a small thing, but it, it actually makes a huge difference uh, in terms of of the entire uh, viewing experience. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to like kind of say thanks for getting on because <laughs> I'm a, I'm a stats nerd, so I love that as yeah. well. Yeah, I gotta be honest. I I had the feeling that Gil doesn't like me. Gil? Yeah. You you need to stop calling her Gil. Gil? Yeah, yeah. That's why. It's Gil? Gil? Oh, sorry, I also, I also I know that reason. Stain, he's really <laughs> obsessed with that, like Gil? saying Gil? the right Gil? names. Gil? Isn't that yeah. true? I'm saying yeah. it in Danish. <laughs> yeah. Gil. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Gil. That's sorry a, about that. I feel like every every. Maybe that's why she doesn't like you. Yeah, uh, I mean, that would make sense. Did you call her Gil one time? On purpose. Yeah. Just, to <laughs> <laughs> just to annoy her. <laughs> no, I feel like every 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 chance she gets to, to talk about time wasting, she takes it. Even if I'm not on the court. <laughs> She will. If someone is time time wasting, she will get me in there uh, yeah, somehow. Yeah, I oh, also he just did it on a sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I also hate your time wasting. So <laughs> I think that's good. We we had a we had a little argument on on the court and uh, we we faced each other in the first round on Bali. Was it Second on Bali? Round. Second round, round yeah. on Bali, one of the tournaments there. Um, I think I was getting <laughs> ready to re- retrieve a serve, and Christian was. Um, I don't know what he's doing before <laughs> he serves, but looking down and, <laughs> Something and, and, weird, and yeah. I was waiting for a little too long. Then I stopped, raised my hand, um, <laughs> and I think the um, then he served, and I did not receive it. The umpire said something to me, and I was like, I mean, he's 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 he's, he's using way too much time. And Christian immediately responded like, <laughs> he's the slowest in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so like when Neymar actually uh <laughs> should receive a free kick but he never gets it because he's diving all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I I laughed immediately. I think it was so funny yeah. that you got so yeah. frustrated yeah. in the moment. But you are time wasting a lot. But anyway ah. it, it it raises an interesting thing about like bias like because yeah. uh, obviously as a commentator you watch a lot of badminton and you're as we spoke about you're a former coach so you also like badminton to be played in a certain way and some players will play more like that some players will play in a diff- completely different way that doesn't attract you uh, so much but as a commentator you need to try and be pretty neutral right but uh, like that must be really difficult in some situations it is difficult and uh, I don't think I succeed uh, mm all the time I, we, we try to be uh, totally neutral that's a difference to commentating on danish tv where you have to be very biased mm. but but here we have to be neutral it's very difficult and and sometimes uh, it also gets interpreted uh, wrong because sometimes uh, if you were playing each other in the men's singles i would try to explain what you needed to do to beat Anas because i see Anas as the favorite mm. yeah. and um and if you're playing uh, a totally different player, it might be the opposite way around. But I might know more about your game and your playing style, whilst another player might be un- more or less unknown to me. So, yeah, so that way you would naturally speak a bit more about me, and someone yes. would interpret it as you prefer me over exactly, the other. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so that's always um, that's always a, a difficulty. Mm. Uh, I don't uh, particularly, in terms of time wasting or, or playing the rules and so on. I would definitely play the rules, and and I don't mind that because the umpires are the ones that has the tools to sort of um, um, control the match and and make sure it's played by the rules, and that's their job. And the player's job is to go to the line, hmm. perhaps even a little bit over the line, because otherwise you're not certain hmm. that you are on the line. Hmm. Um, so so that uh, that that's. Um, 
that's really important to say that it's the umpires who has the tools to control the match. Yeah, to tell someone if they're actually crossing that line. Yes, we have a lot of discussion right now about the um, the uh, medical timeouts, which I feel is not really well um, uh, described in the rules. Um, it's a little bit uncertain. Can mm-hmm. you get uh, a cool spray? Uh, can you get how some many tape times? or should yeah. you? Yeah, how many times? Yeah. And can you get a cool spray on the left angle and then the right angle and then the uh, yeah. wrist and then the left wrist and so on so all these things is something that that um, that we can discuss but it's the umpires who has the the, the tools to control it mm. yeah mm. I, i think in like in some situations it must also be like even more difficult to control it uh, if I again go back to when we won Thomas Cup in, in 2016 uh, I remember in the end of my match you also say something like uh, that's probably going to be the last words I say Yeah. Uh, because you kind of get overwhelmed by, by feelings Yeah. and I guess there are still, obviously you're Dane, uh, but there are still also some players that you actually have worked with uh, Yeah. And it, it must be, I know that again from personal experience when I was doing commentary at the Olympics, it's so hard to kind of put those personal feelings aside. Uh, I remember I had a match between uh, Victor uh, Axelsen and uh, Scott Evans at the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, and obviously I was commentating for Danish TV, so I needed to support Victor. Uh, but at the same time, Scott, Scott was is a good friend. one of my two best friends. Uh, so I also really wanted him to do well at the Olympics. Uh, and it, like it was it was so f- such a frustrating feeling because yeah, I, I really didn't know how to park that, that those kind of feelings. Is that something you feel like you get better at or is that still difficult? Like if you watch a Thomas Cup match or a Uber Cup match? Uh, I feel I get better at it. Mm-hmm. Um, we discussed um, in, in the back talk before we met here saying that maybe some of yeah. the biggest moments as a commentator mm. and so on. And that is my biggest moment as a commentator. The When Denmark won the Thomas Cup at 19 all, I said, that's probably going to be the last words for me because I couldn't speak anymore. Mm. I I had tears running down my uh, my cheeks and mm. I I had, um, I was choking. I couldn't say anything because I was just so happy that finally the Thomas Cup um, got to Denmark. Uh, I, I tried as a coach <laughs> yeah, a couple yeah. of times to yeah. win it. And I know how hard it is, and and the feeling that was one of the days where I was the most envious of not being uh, either on the chair or at the uh, bleachers behind the court um, when Denmark won the Thomas Cup. That was a fantastic, um, fantastic moment. Yeah. Do Do you have any like other experiences where like you felt like emotionally you've really been? Uh, like affected uh, like a, a good example for me again would be at the one of the times at the Olympics I think it was in 2012 uh, when uh, Mikhail Lukosz I don't know how many of you guys know him but uh, a Polish men's doubles player when he ruptured his Achilles at the Olympics uh, and I was there and th- that was like also a moment that I just remember because like being there and knowing that it was It was just the end of of his career, and everyone kind of knew that there. Yeah. Like, so, do you have like like any other experiences that just kind of stick with you apart from? Uh, no, no, not that sticks with me. There, there's um, there's things that um, touches the emotions and so on. I, mm. I remember when uh, watching out of the corner of my eye, Shiyuki roll his ankle against oh. you in in Indonesia, and uh, that that was not uh, fun. Uh, mm. Jill can absolutely not watch those pictures because she's suffered a couple of knee injuries herself, mm. and that means that I have to okay. look at them, and I don't want to look at them because <laughs> I, I really I can't see that, and yeah. oh, that that's just uh, I, I once saw one dislocate his kneecap yeah. in my practice. It, it was Oof. terrible. Oof. Um, yeah. So so they get there, but but there's also I mean I get emotional at other times. For instance, when Rachinak uh, won uh, Malaysia Open, I just thought that was fantastic because she sort of she sort of went against her normal playing style. She mm. decided that she was going to go with it. She was going to take the chance doing something that she was not necessarily uh, fond of or it wasn't her natural game, mm. and that sort of. Um, uh, spark some emotions yeah, yeah. Uh, wow that's fantastic so when people um, sort of overcome obstacles um, that's um, that's something that uh, is emotional and mm. um, we, we talked about a little bit earlier in this podcast about trying to kind of like 
implement some of the things that the the best in the world is doing at the moment. Um, I had a discussion with uh, Joachim Pearson. Mm. You know him as well. Yeah. Um, maybe like a month ago or something, and we talked about instead of trying to catch up with who's the best at the moment and trying to implement those things, why don't we think about what is going to be the next next thing? Yeah. <laughs> and I think we have we talked about it once. Uh, it's interesting if people are like in in thirty years looking back at uh, the best in the world right now and being like they are not really good. Mm. I yeah. mean. What do you think is going to be like the next thing? I mean, how <laughs> how how can you get even better than what Victor is now? I mean, it's it because right now it looks difficult. <laughs> yeah, I've just been training with him again this morning, yeah. and I feel like it's basically. <laughs> but I, I just <laughs> think it's really really interesting. How how does men's single look mm. in in twenty five years uh, mm. from now? Do you have a? I mean. No, I, I don't. We're putting stain on the spot. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know how it looks in in twenty five years from now, but but I mean, yeah, it's it's going back twenty five years and watching some of the uh, badminton played there is is not impressive. Mm. Um, they wouldn't score a whole lot of points uh, in today's badminton. But we changed the scoring system and so on. Um, I think analyzing what Victor is, is doing well here is um, is something that we can do, but. Uh, But uh, I, I think uh, we should we should take we should learn a little bit from the past as well, and and then um, also see how, how can we how can we move forward here. And it seems to be going in waves. That mm. if you have a, a strong attacking player, then a player comes forward uh, who's really really good at uh, retrieving and and playing well, um, and then an even stronger attacking player or the attacking mm. player improves. Mm. His or hers uh, ability to um, to play rally style or the basic, the solids, um, the uh, shot quality, and so on, and then um, a player with a little bit better overall skills, but still retrieve good retrieving, good defense, good stamina comes out. So I think it's I think it's in in waves. Mm. But I think one of the um, one of the important things in this is also. The way you approach your practice. I mean, the way I see it. Now we, we we get a little bit personal, but you haven't had the best of years. You've had a lot of injuries and and stuff. So so how are you approaching every practice? Are you approaching it the same way as um, when you came home and and won the Indonesia uh, Masters, beating Momota in the final? You must have been all fired up back then. And said, hey, this is going well. Badminton is fun. I want to practice. Let's practice and so on. So I feel that. If you can sort of uh, muster up that same feeling, that same energy, that same belief, even if things are not going well, then things will eventually start to go well. Mm -hmm. Not from day one to day two, but in the long run. So the the uh, the ability to invest in yourself, in, in invest in in terms of believing that you're doing the right thing, and do that for. A prolonged period of time. I think that's really, really important. And I felt that many of the players that I've talked to over the years, um, they've been afraid how things were going to go. Mm. And and when I talked to them later on, when they've achieved a lot, uh, uh, Tina Baum is uh, is a player that I remember when she won her first Danish championship. She was a big, big favorite, and she was extremely nervous. Mm. And she won it. And and now she's won like nine. She's won three All Englands and so on. So how nervous would she be if she knew that her career was going to be a success? How nervous would she have been in that match? Mm. Not a lot, I suspect. But it's because you feel that hey, maybe this is the only chance I get. Maybe, maybe it's um, this is now. This is my time. I got to get it now. Um, that that sometimes hampers people from. Um, working long term and everybody's working short term. We've seen it uh, over and over with people playing tournament after tournament after tournament, and slowly they're getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. And they're not taking time off to sort of um, do the uh, homework in order to uh, succeed. Interesting. That was a long. That was a yeah. long answer. Yeah. Um, you can cut you, it. You, you, you cut got it. around a lot. No, it, yeah. it was uh, interesting. It was great. Um, I, I just have one quick follow up to it, like because you say this thing about that it goes in waves. Would you agree with me that right now, especially in men's singles, that 
if you need to be able to win, you need to have the weapons to actually score your own points. So we we are on that part of the wave where it's that's like an important thing. Yes, to be able to and, win. And I don't think it's coming back the the other way where you where you can just rely on the opponents making mistakes. Yeah. I think you yeah. need to score your own points, but there's different ways of scoring your own mm. points. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to see. Um, a transition to that yeah because i feel like if if we say like uh, it goes in waves like when chong wei and lin dan came forward they were also kind of like that that they were very aggressive and scoring a lot of points and then the game changed a little bit into more uh, of an all round you needed to be very stable you needed to be able to neutralize and yeah you let your opponent yeah. make the mistakes and yeah now it's going uh yeah up on the wave again it's like definitely kind of. round and circles up i yeah. mean all the time yeah. Yeah. a guy comes with an extremely good attack yeah then it's uh, demanding more from the defensive players yeah. and it's quite interesting again yeah uh, interesting and to see in what the next move is going to be yeah uh, in terms of net game i mean mm. uh, just um maybe six seven years ago you never played the net from a low position yeah that was simply too dangerous yeah now you do it you just do it with a lot better quality mm. because you practice it because that's that's where there's some openings yeah i'm thinking that there are some some improvements to be made at the net for instance mm. I remember I played uh, Hu Yun from Hong Kong a few times, and he had this one retrieve from, uh, I guess, both sides, actually, where he used his backhand. And he was, like, playing it so close to that that I could not yeah. I could not do anything about it. That, that, that's, <laughs> one my, that's one of my, um, what's it called in English? Pet peeves. Yeah. The service returns. I, I see a lot of people return low services with the forehand, and I hate it. Mm. I, I truly hate it because it's just a, it's just a worse return. Mm. And if you go back and look at the matchups between Peter Gerda and Taufik Hidayat, you can see that Peter was the dominating player uh, for a long, long time. And then suddenly Taufik started to serve out of the court to Peter's forehand side. Peter was fantastic at uh, returning services. Mm. And it became much more difficult for him. Suddenly he could get the, the shuttle into play. Mm. Uh, I know it's perhaps a bad example, but but there's just so many more opportunities with the backhand return, mm. in my opinion. Mm. So that's I'm something not, I'm to not work 100% on. I'm not 100% sure that I agree on, on that one. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on the player. I mean, some players has very, very good variations uh, with their forehand and very good no. spin. <laughs> uh, I would mention a guy <laughs> like Janu Janssen. He was really really good retreating with the with the forehand um both during the spin but also i mean always up here so yeah. that he could either push it or, or, or block it um i think i don't know if i'm mistaken but i think victor is retreating quite a lot with his forehand yes often you should change o- that often often yeah, yeah i mean <laughs> maybe there's <laughs> maybe it could be even room for, worse for the rest there. of us yeah. if he's uh, <laughs> doing a backhand I, ha- I haven't given it a lot of thought. I actually remember you mentioned it for me before. I think. Yeah. yeah, it's more difficult to spin though if you use the backhand. I mean, this one is a bit more difficult. Yeah, but than, you don't than necessarily want to spin it. It depends not, on not how, 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 how easy is it to lift it away again, <clears throat> and how easy can you disguise it? And there's a lot of of um, returns <laughs> with the forehand that's just a lift, which mm. is basically uh, similar to a high service. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, a, that's a technical yeah. discussion. No, but it's yeah. interesting. I like yeah. to have I like to have those yeah. uh, those discussions. Yeah. What can you do with the backhand that you can't do with the forehand? Yeah, a lot that's better a deceptions. A lot better deceptions. Yeah, all four corners deceptive. Is this both for right-handed and left-handed players? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting. I need to look at some video actually. I'll yeah. send you like. Uh, <laughs> Hundred clips after this with with players <laughs> using their forehand and just uh, <laughs> winning directly. The state, on the, the state <laughs> just be saying, okay. but it could be even yeah. better. If you did <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess so. It will be impossible for you to yeah. ever win that discussion. I got a question from uh, from a good friend, uh, Kauri, here before we uh, we started this podcast, uh, and I will uh, read that one to you right now. Um, the first was actually he sent three questions. The first was the one you just answered. Uh, you get the second one here. What do you think of the way badminton is being presented as a marketable product? What can we learn from other sports to make sure our sport flourish in the future? Let's go, well, Steen. That, that's almost a podcast of its own. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's um, a long one to finish. It's that. a long um, one. Yeah. Well, I think we've come a long, long way in badminton from the days when I was coaching. So 
it's looking much much better uh, nowadays the uh, consistency in the tournament presentation is um, is much better um, obviously there's also some um, some things that I've, I feel that we perhaps could uh, take from other sports um, both um, you and I are, are much into uh, American football mm. and um, and um, the uh, the information you can get from the players, um, the uh, interviews and so on. That's something that we can work on. I know that BWF is is um, giving classes for uh, for English education, and there's Danish players that are now speaking uh, Bahasa, uh, <laughs> Mandarin, and, yeah. and stuff like that. So. So getting uh, more info from uh, the players, that's also, you've seen it with some of your vlogs, that, that um, the fans, they want to know more about uh, the players. I think one one thing that's, um, that's uh, really important is to enhance the experience in the arena for the audience. Uh, that's something that, um, I feel that um, is is um, th there's a lot of um, potential there compared to uh, American sports, the ones that I've uh, experienced. How do you feel that can be done? Because I, I I hear that a lot, and I completely agree. Uh, but I think like one of the big big disadvantages we have is that we have so many matches because we are playing men's singles, women's singles, women's doubles, men's doubles, mixed doubles. We have yeah. so many matches all the time, so it's like it's so difficult to to do anything around the matches I, f I feel like and even on finals day where we only have five matches it's still something that lasts seven eight nine yeah. hours uh, to complete a day like that yeah it's it's a really good um it's a really good question i, I don't have the answer to yeah. it but but the thing is maybe maybe this podcast could start a forum for mm. for discussing these things because we might say we, we would r like to enhance the viewer experience in the arena but we're not really sure how to do it but mm. but others might uh, might chip in with some ideas mm. on how to do it it could be uh, a radio uh, a stadium radio so that uh, the, the the ones sitting in the arena have access to extra information mm. from uh, not necessarily commentators but from others that, um, that gives them information about the matches not in the um, in the overall uh, speaker system but in in the radio that gives you stats that um, uh, actually, competitions yeah. and stuff like that I don't have the answer but the thing is it's important to have a forum to discuss it and to get ideas and to get inputs from uh, from other people at, and from other sports yeah, at Denmark Open I actually see that quite often that some people are uh, when they watch the matches in the stadium at the same time on their phone they have the Danish TV yeah. on uh, just to hear the commentators yeah. so they're watching the match and then in one year they have a ear part or something so yeah. they can actually hear live commentary uh yeah, exactly on the match yeah exactly that's not a bad idea but let's just take american football uh, as an example what 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 do they do very well about the the whole show the live show for, for me i think one of the biggest biggest uh, things is the information flow uh, like even there's a lot of breaks in nfl uh, like the the actual game time is quite short compared to how long the the match actually is as a TV program, but I never feel bored because I, I feel like every time there's a break, there's a new statistic or a new uh, information from uh, from the uh, commentators. I also know in an NFL match that the uh, the two main commentators they will have a pre meeting with the teams, so the two official teams that are playing before the match to get some inside information. So they actually get that access, which would, of course, if if Stain he was able to talk to us on, uh, yeah alone and just they get a lot of information about what are we working on what is our tactical approach and stuff he would be able to give so much more information to to the viewer that, that's one thing where yeah. i feel like injury updates that yeah. that's not even on the match day that's yeah. up to it because people can bet on the sport so uh, they, they, they can in badminton as well so if you were playing tournament if you were playing the commonwealth games against three count today uh, you would have to give in an injury report saying have i been practicing full <laughs> have I been limited mm. or uh, have I been sitting out uh, and what the specific injury was mm. because if I'm going to put money on you winning I want to know where you are mm. Mm. and we, we don't do that in badminton and sometimes it's even difficult to figure out what has happened yeah. if, if people are injured so so the information flow is is definitely uh, one thing that could get better and and I think 
we need to do something for the people in the arena. I know they're having a party sometimes mm. uh, and in some arenas and they're really, really good at it. But there's other um, ar arenas where there's not that many uh, people attending. So that's one of the things that um, that could be done there. Um, yeah, 100%. But I mean, you're also right that too many matches is um, is obvious. It's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to build a great show around uh, I don't know how many matches is there during first second round. I mean, that's and that's that's going to be uh, interesting to see the um, the schedule for the 2023 season because we don't know how the tournaments are going to be um, uh, arranged mm -hmm. in the calendar. I, I think it's probably going to look a little bit like what we've seen so far. But one of the things that um, that uh, could be a good idea is to have the Super Thousand tournaments as standalone events, in my opinion, and and also um, more than five days. Yeah. I would say like eight, nine days or something like that, so that we don't have to play at nine o'clock in the morning yeah. uh, when it's difficult to get an audience. Yeah. But all of this is, I guess, something to do with uh, economy and um, yeah. and resources and so on. Um, but but. That would definitely hype it and and make it uh, stand out a little bit more. Um. Yeah. I would really really like to see rest days in between yeah. matches. We yeah. have it in the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, <coughs> yeah that's a ten day event, right? I think uh, I actually just saw the schedule was released uh, the other day for yeah. the Olympics in Paris, and it's almost the same as in Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. And but I think you're right about it's it's uh, it's it's about economy. How many days? Do they want to to book the the arena and, um, and I mean I guess yeah. it's the, uh, uh, pretty pricey at, at, at some arenas, but mm. yeah, volunteers mm. having to um, to travel for yeah. perhaps one and a half week instead of one week. There, yeah. There's a lot of Paying extra hotels for uh, the umpires and lots the BWF of, people lots of extra and expenses. Hawk guy people and uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uh, extra expenses for every day that yeah. you you add to the event for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's. It's interesting to see whether there will be uh, two separate tours at some point. I yeah, mean, I suggested that, that once uh, in a uh, Badminton Euro podcast, and I can tell you that uh, I got a lot of uh, <laughs> very negative feedback from uh, the fans. Why is that? They are very uh, anxious about then what about mixed doubles? What do you do with mixed doubles? And uh, they were basically saying that it was just because I didn't care about the doubles disciplines, uh, which... Yeah. Which I wouldn't don't. say to some <laughs> extent is true, but I still feel like it's in many ways at least the singles discipline that are drawing the most attention. Uh, and I, yeah, in some ways, I feel like it could be actually good for both the men and the women if we separated the two. Is but it's definitely it, it, something that's a little bit difficult to talk about because it is you will you will yeah. definitely yeah, uh, annoy a bunch mm -hmm. of people if uh, if you talk negative about some of the categories mm -hmm. and um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You were about to say uh, something, Sting. Yeah, Sting. Go ahead. Yeah, it could also be singles doubles tournaments. Mm, it doesn't yeah. have to be men no, and women true, tournaments. True. Yeah, true. I, I don't know, and and I realize that um, that there's going to be a lot of strong opinions about it, and uh, we don't know where the future is going to take us. Hopefully, it's going to keep developing uh, as well as it's it's been going since since I started traveling back in in nine to five. Um, that, yeah. that's that's for sure but another thing is definitely a uh, lack of content as you, as you just mentioned you don't know much about Son Wan Ho who? <laughs> Son Wan <laughs> no. Ho uh, no exactly I mean the, 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 the former world number one just like five years ago or something like that in men's single yeah you don't know much about what Cheng Long doing at the moment I mean uh, is crazy. he retired or, or not <laughs> I mean uh, what's going on there so lack of content um the fans do not get much, uh, so they can hold on to certain uh, personalities, get interested in their in their everyday life, uh, their way of playing and stuff like that. I agree, yeah. but I also think that we are on the right track here. You are having your your vlog. Um, there's uh, several podcasts out. I I know uh, Sapsire is doing a vlog uh, as yeah. well. Yeah, uh, also a very good vlog. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I it hope. Is growing. That um, that it's growing that way. I also hope that the BWF will also um, uh, sort of step up um, their um, information uh, and 
and media uh, mm-hmm. game, but they've also done well. Um, they, I think, they are the uh, they have most this growing limited. Um, there's, there's something called Badminton Unlimited, yes. Yeah. But yeah, it's true what you're about to say, that it was one of the most growing uh, uh, social media channels. Uh, I think that Instagram, yeah. right, when they crossed one million, it was uh, of all the, was it Olympic sports? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not really sure. Yeah, but Where they've shown um, the biggest growth in a one-year period or something yes, like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but I think a, a forum to discuss ideas and to act quickly uh, if, we, if we find something that's, the world tour is the flagship, uh, in my opinion, of of, um, of elite badminton. So if we find something that needs to be changed, that we can act swiftly and, and get it done. It, that's one of the other things in, in uh, American football. After each season, all the team owners get together and discuss what have we seen uh, of uh, problems? How can we deal with them? What have we seen of new opportunities? How can we implement them and then things get done yeah uh, so so the um you see ch- changes every year actually to yeah. try and better the product yeah so the uh. command chain is really really short and i don't think that all things applied to the world tour necessarily needs to be applied to all of badminton yeah. to recreational badminton and stuff like that mm. that's not at all necessary in my opinion mm. we've talked about um uh that the uh, court attendants, when they come on to uh, to mop sweat away from the court, they could hold the players' towels so that you can actually towel down next to the mopper mm. so you can show them where the sweat is and stuff like that. That's easy. I mean, it's just to agree that this is what we're going to do because it works in tennis. Mm, yeah. In tennis, you don't see the players walk to their kit boxes and towel down and then go back. No, the uh, ball boys, the ball girls, they have... Um, yeah. the towels and, and all these small ideas we need a forum to to present that to and, and who can make some um, some swift decisions the athletes commission yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where it's done no it's not it's they not. only had like one w- one vote for yeah I think there's 28 or something yeah. in the council and <clears throat> one is from the athletes commission but I agree 100% we've talked about this bunch of times that if we have something that we want to to raise where do we go? I mean, mm. there is nowhere. So it's, it's 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 a problem. There might there might be, but we might not be aware of it. Mm. And also the ability to say, "Hey, Anas, thank you for your suggestion. We don't like it. We're not going to use it." Mm. Okay, then that's it. That's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, guys, we could uh, continue forever. I'm sure there's uh, there's so much to talk about. The, I guess this is one of our longest episodes. I think uh, it is so the longest far. one actually. Um, it's because Stein he's talking all the time. Yeah. You're talking too much, Stein. I'm no, talking it's, very it's, slow. <laughs> it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much yeah. for being on on the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, Thank you for having me. Of course, we will be back with part two some some day some day. One hundred percent. If you are if you are if you are willing to do it, we would love to. So, guys, thank you so much. Um, as Stein just mentioned, we need a forum uh, to talk about a bunch of stuff, uh, and you can go ahead in the comment se- comment section uh, right now. Um, I mean, yeah, we we have discussed a lot, uh, so give us your perspective on on some of the some of the topics. We would uh, love that. Thank you very much for watching, listening. Please subscribe to the channel, and see you in the next episode of the Bamton Experience. Bye, bye, guys.